welcome. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Excellent. We were we were just getting started. Um, just telling everyone, um, kind of the this platform is very casual, and we wanted uh, no one to wait for us to start talking about the wine to actually start drinking. And um, yeah, there is no ceremony here. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna try <laughs> to keep it as interactive and fun as possible. The other thing is, um, feel free to interrupt at any point in time if you have questions. You know, this is a. Uh, the beauty of having um, a group that I think is as connected as this one. I feel like I'm looking around at a lot of these screens and seeing um, people who are good friends. So, um, you know what, if you have thoughts, share them, just hop on in. Yeah. Um, so I feel like this is a good time. It's 6.05. Mm -hmm. We can go ahead and get started with our introductions. Yeah, well, uh, I guess I'll start by introducing us. So um, for anyone who I haven't met, my name's Aaron. This is my beautiful wife, Gina. Uh, and we are Wine Cult. So we're a small boutique uh, wine club and concierge surface uh, that really focuses on working with um, boutique sustainable producers uh, around the world. Um, we really started our company focused on California and thanks to uh, some guidance and some help uh, from a number of folks on this call, Lee, I'm looking at you, uh, have really enhanced our own palette. Um, you know, our mission for for the company was always to expand the American palate um, and it, having relationships with really, really talented winemakers like Chris, who's going to be speaking to us, like uh, like Dusty Nabor, who's also on the call. Thanks for joining us, man. Um, makes that possible. And we get to share that with you guys. Uh, this format of being um, virtual is relatively new to us. We started when COVID hit um, we had classically done all of these types of events in person, but it's translated really well to a digital space and they're really fun. And we've now done a little over 40 of these. So we're hitting our rhythm a, a, a little bit. Um, but you know what, uh, feel free to poke fun at, at anything you like, cause, cause this is here for your entertainment too. Um, <laughs> I don't know with that, Gina, you want to yeah, Take the reins. do the next slide. I just want to make sure that everyone can see our slide. We have very few slides. We promise to not be super nerdy this, about this it. This is new. The this is new. Are new. We're very excited. We decided to get fancy for this one. Um, so this is our third or fourth installment of Behind the Bottle. It's um, always uh, brought to you by us, Wine Cult, um, but we bring in some winemakers and people in the industry who are really special to us for a number of different reasons um, and who we believe have really, really cool, important things to say about the wine or the industry. Um, and tonight we formatted this just a little differently than we normally do because we actually brought in a um, our distribution rep, Lee Reedy. Um, she is here and we are kind of gonna link together the whole wine industry and how um, distributors, importers, winemakers, and retailers all work together. So um, tonight we have Chris Miller. He is, um, there you go. Thank you for waving, Chris. He is a <laughs> master sommelier and he's the owner and proprietor of Seabold Cellars. Um, under Seabold, I will let him dive into all of the amazing details, um, but Seabold Cellars also has Bold Wine Co. and the Adwa label, which is everything that we're drinking tonight. Um, his director of customer experience, Katiana Sokol, is online as well. And like we've mentioned, Lee Reedy from The Source, uh, she is the Central Coast sales rep, um, but is based here in Santa Barbara with us. She lives just a couple minutes away from our house. And, and is a dear, dear friend. Yes, and we, we love her. We love you. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. So before I let the important people talk about all the important stuff, I felt the need to give you guys some quick context on how it is, how the system is today and why it is this way. So um, I'm gonna introduce the three tier system in a moment, but in order for you to even understand that, I have to go all the way back to prohibition. I promise it's fast. If you're a history nerd, you'll enjoy this part. If you're not, just keep drinking. Um, <laughs> um, but I got really excited because of course, like in the December, I think it's December 7th, um, people always make these posts about Prohibition ending, it's the anniversary of prohibition ending, but a lot of people don't really understand what prohibition is and why it came to be. Um, 
Prohibition uh, was an era in American history when production and the sale of alcoholic beverages were allowed, um, outlawed, I'm sorry, by the US Constitution. It officially started on January 17, 1920 with the passage of the 18th Amendment and ended on December 5th, 1933 with the 20, when the 21st Amendment was ratified. Um, it only lasted about 13 years, um, but its origins can be traced all the way back to the 1800s um, with the temperance movements. And um, a lot of the people in the temperance movements were Protestants who believed that alcohol was destroying public health and morality. I disagree, but that's okay. It's different times. Um, it quickly became super unpopular for obvious reasons. And from that, uh, it out came a ton of black market alcohol sales. And a lot of the like gangsters that we kind of poke, poke fun at today, like Al Capone, um, they kind of built their empires around this time because they were the ones that were selling the good stuff. Um, so after, with fast forwarding to the end of prohibition, we could, we could talk about this for hours, but I don't want to tonight. We're gonna talk about more exciting stuff. Um, so the passage of the 21st Amendment ending prohibition in 1933, um, with that, the regulation of alcohol sale and consumption was left to the individual states. Um, prior to that, everything was a little out of control. There was a lot of monopolies that were starting and that's one of the reasons why prohibition um, really came to fruition. Um, but then in the end, they, all the states decided that um, they needed to build this structure. So out came the three tier system. Can you move to the next slide please? Um, and this system imposes control and taxes on the alcohol industry and prevents the excess that led to prohibition in the first place. Um, and that puts together the winery, the distributor and ourselves wine cult, the retailer. Um, this uh, system today means that distributors have to purchase their wine from the wineries um, or importers. Uh, Lee is both. So we can talk, she'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they're not allowed to sell directly to consumers. Retailers like restaurants and wine shops or uh, online wine clubs like Wine Cult um, are allowed to purchase wine from the wholesale distributors, which we do. Um, and we're allowed to sell to consumers, you guys. Um, and then a lot of these are general rules. And like I mentioned, the it's up to the states themselves to make the specific rules and, and laws. We all have to abide by, um, here in California, it's called the alcohol beverage control. We all have different license types to do the different things that we do. Um, but all yeah, very confusing. all very confusing. And <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I think it's really cool that we're here today um, to learn a little bit more, more about that and uh, the specifics within each branch of the three tier system. So that was my super speedy history education. Um, you're welcome. I promise to never do that again. That's more Aaron's, uh, Aaron's thing. But so without further ado, I would love to start at the top of the three tier system with Chris Miller and Katiana Sokol, will you please tell us about Seabold Cellars, Bold Wine Co. and Adwa? Uh, sure, yeah, thanks for having us tonight. Um, <clears throat> so Seabold uh, Cellars, we, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, Seabold um, Cellars, we founded in 2014 and I bought the winery in 2017. Uh, we're located in Monterey, we're just one mile off the ocean. So it's cold all the time. And I used to work harvest in Walla Walla, uh, Sonoma and Santa Rita Hills. And having it about 40 degrees colder every day during harvest is a very welcome thing. So we're not like outside working on the crush pad where it's 120 outside. It's, you know, like 70, 80 degrees. So it got to 85 one day last year. So it was crazy. Um, so we have uh, three different projects that we work on at Seabolt Cellars. Uh, Seabolt itself, we do single varietal, single sites of kind of like the best of what we do. Uh, vineyards that we've worked with for a while, we think that we've kind of figured out uh, and it kind of showcases the best of what we have. Uh, Bold is new vineyards that we're working with that we're trying to figure out in those first few years. And we're, we're very happy with the wine. We're continuing to work with those vineyards. 
but maybe aren't quite as polished and ready to stand on their own as single vineyards. So, uh, so they kind of get blended, the different things that we're working with, those kind of get blended together to kind of fill in the gaps until we kind of figure all of that out ourselves. And then we have a joie. And a joie is whatever the hell I feel like doing that. <laughs> so, Chris has uh, a joie. Would... We have Siebold and Bold, and then Chris in all his chaos creates fun things <laughs> through a joie. <laughs> yeah, so a joie is, you know, it's, it's honestly, it was almost born as a form of stress relief, which is weird and like really not what you want to say when you're like, you know, oh, here's my wine. It's my stress relief. <laughs> uh, but it's all the different like experiments that we do. Um, things in the winery like carbonic maceration, uh, when we do uh, pet nat, um, which is always like its own journey and doing that. Um, different skin contact on whites, like anything that kind of fits outside the norm that you know, doesn't fit within what most people consider like, you know, like quote unquote mainstream wines. So, you know, when you pick up Siebel, when you pick up Bold, I want to know that you know what you're getting. With a joie, like other than it being delicious, who knows? So just it's in there, it's in the bottle and it's things that we've just been having fun with. So that's the short version. That's <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It is delicious. Yeah. I wanted oh, to thanks. interrupt really quickly and just let people know that um, just a reminder, please ask questions. Um, we're going to be kind of leading more of these questions, but if you have a different question, please interrupt. And Chris may or may not have to pop off just a little early after he's finished talking. So I want to make sure that if you do have any questions, ask them, don't hesitate. Um, but um, so just to pop back in, um, I felt like it would be good for us to really start talking about this columbard. Um, I do not come across Columbard very often. So what inspired you to start working with this grape? And were you surprised with the finished product? Uh, tell me, tell me more about that. Sure. So uh, there's, there's a couple of producers that do a good job in California, but honestly, even come from my position as a wine buyer previously, um, I could only name a couple of producers and I was into all the geeky things. So there's not a lot of it uh, being produced, but there's quite a bit of it planted. So Columbard was the most planted grape in California at one time. So for winemaking, um, there's these little tiny patches. It went to a lot of kind of innocuous wine back in the day, not because the grape couldn't stand on its own, but because nobody ever wanted to label it as Columbard. So like you've had Columbard, if you'd have, if you've had cheap like wine, because a lot of this is grown in the Central Valley and you've had like, oh, just like, they'd literally put this into like a Chardonnay for, you know, Woodbridge or something like that uh, to make it better. Not even to flush it out, not because it's cheap, but just like all the Chardonnay there wasn't so great. Put a little Columbard in it, makes it all better. Yeah. So um, it has really great acid retention, especially in hot climates, which is one of the reasons they planted out there. Um, kind of the thought behind it was, you know, we're, we're very anti-intervention in the winery. Um, it's very seldom that I really like get in there and work with the grapes too hard to make it into the finished product. So having something that's growing there that actually has excellent acid retention that tastes really great on its own was, you know, really appealing to me. Uh, and then that kind of California heritage to it as well. Uh, these grapes like, you know, and I think I put down when I talk about it, it's, you know, 60 plus years old, but they're probably closer to 80 to hundred years old. So they've been around since you know, about the time of prohibition, actually. So they go back quite a long ways. Um, anytime you're able to work with really old vines, that's always kind of like a big turn on for winemakers. It's just like, oh, like to actually get into that. The vines matured, you get different flavors out of it, more of a sense of minerality. And you get a uh, kind of the, the vine really manages itself once it gets to that age, which is really, really cool to see. Um, when we started making the wine, I honestly, I wasn't sure what we were going to do with it. Uh, we made this for a few years and then after working with it for a couple of years, I'm like, yeah, let's, yeah, I think this stands on its own. Because again, you know, a lot of the times when I work with a vineyard, it's, you know, two, three vintages in, four vintages in where I'm like, are we going to actually do this on its own? Sometimes it's right away, but a lot of times I work with it for a while. So after a few vintages, I was like, yeah, this is like tasty. I realized, you know, we were drinking more of this at the winery with the guys you know, and our interns and that kind of stuff. They're like, oh yeah, let's pop some cone bar today. I'm like, we've drank like nine or 10 cases worth of this, like straight out of keg. Cause we actually had it on keg at the winery. <laughs> I was like, we should probably go ahead and sell it. Cause I'm not just buying it for all of you people to drink. 
Like so, I said, these projects are very much the Chris creative project. I already made the wine and then I was like, hey, maybe we should sell some of this. It's delicious. <laughs> You'd think it would occur to me earlier on in the process. Not not as much. I'm a little thick at it. Um, but it was just like, yeah, I was like, yeah, this is super tasty. I would dig on this. It was like just like inexpensive, like pop it open, white wine, refreshing. And it's kind of interesting too. And this reminds me of like some of the things that you'll see more often in like France, Germany, Italy, those kind of places where it's, you know, it has this like kind of certain earthiness to it as well. And it's not pretentious. It's just like yummy, not pretentious, easy drinking, white. So. Excellent. Um, you mentioned uh, anti-intervention or low intervention. Mm -hmm. That is a huge passion of ours. But um, for anyone on this uh, call, uh, I know that that can differ for certain winemakers. What does low intervention winemaking mean to you? Sure. So uh, first and foremost, like I'm never going to work. And I think it actually backs up to how you're sourcing fruit. Mm -hmm. So I never source uh, grapes from a place that I don't think has a very good shot of avoiding all the things that I'm about to tell you about. So, you know, it's like site selection. Is this grape suited to this vineyard? Have I seen good, you know, representation out of this vineyard? Um, so the anti-intervention thing, low intervention, minimum intervention, it's trying to do the least amount possible to the grapes in order to produce the wine. And this kind of goes back even with food. If you talk to any great chef, I don't know a single chef that'd be like, oh, well, you want to be a great chef start with something just really crappy, like that old moldy stuff in the back of the fridge and like see how many things you can do to it to the <laughs> point where you actually want to eat it. Like you put enough sauce on it, you put enough butter, like it'll get there. And you're just like, that's kind of like, I'm not that good of a winemaker, frankly, like to be able to do that. Like if I don't start with good, it's just not gonna, it's just like, it's just gonna taste like crap. So even if I wanted to be like super interventionist, like I couldn't do it. So uh, a lot of times when you have uh, grapes come into the winery, you know, you run the chemistry on them because this is composed of acids, it's composed of proteins, it's composed of sugars. The two things you look at most in a winery are sugar and acid. And usually in a lot of spots, uh, particularly in warmer climates, one of the two is out of whack. And this is the world over in the less than perfect areas. Um, and that kind of invites people to put their own stamp on it where you're just like, well, you know, Sugars are a little high. They put a little bit of water in it. That lowers the sugar. It brings down the alcohol. Everybody's happy. But as soon as you start doing that, it's a very slippery slope. And here's why. So whether you're, it doesn't matter what you're adjusting. As soon as you start fiddling with something, uh, it moves all the other things too. So, and within the grapes, you have all these different kind of, um, again, proteins, molecules, all these different flavors. What winemakers generally do is they'll mess around with one or two elements that dilute these thousands of different elements. So you kind of lose a little bit of the soul out of it too, for me. So uh, every now and then you do have something where it's kind of problematic. The wine is otherwise great and needs a little help here and there. And that's to your discretion, you know, but it's, it's more about just getting it right from go, picking it at the right time, having the grapes come from the right places. Then you literally just crush them, ferment them, and let them kind of be on their own. Um, a lot of times, this has taken the mean uh, less oak usage on a lot of wines, although that's not necessarily within the definition. And you know, we generally have very little new oak on most of our wines. Um, yeah. So what you see is what you get. We literally pick this grape, we put it in a press, we squeezed all the juice out, we fermented it in a stainless steel tank, we aged in some neutral oak for a little bit of time. And we put it in a bottle and got delivered to you. That's all we did to it. So there's also, um, you know, for that fermentation process, you know, there's all these yeasts that you can get that, you know, ferment the wines. And I can show you like booklets. Like I was in, I was making wine for about 12 years before, you know, I bought my own place. And I didn't even realize like all this existed. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, it was like, oh yeah, if you ferment your red wines with this and it'll, it'll lend itself to more raspberry aromatics. I'm like, well, just put raspberries in it. Like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, don't, <laughs> don't be, if, it, if the grapes need that much help, it's not gonna make good mine no matter what you do. So just go ahead and just, you know, pick better grapes. Don't plant that there if it needs that much help. <laughs> so there's all these little things like that and like little workarounds to make it fuller, richer, this and that, just like, I don't know. It just doesn't really appeal to me personally. Chris, you, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier. 
Oh yeah, go ahead. What does the oak do? What does the oak, putting it on oak, do? Sure, so you know, at its most basic, and we'll start with neutral oak and then we'll kind of go back to uh, new oak. So for neutral oak, it's a very, very gentle oxidation process. So it's a little bit of air touching the wine for you know three to six to 12 to 24 months at times, depending on what kind of wine you're gonna make. So, so you have that little, uh, little bit of oak on there that just, it's more about oxygen, it's a vessel and it allows it to interact with, it, with its environment and lets it breathe a little bit. Because you do have a lot of microbial processes that are going on inside the wine, particularly the first 12 months. It starts to slow down after that, but the first 12 months, you've got a lot going on in the wine. There's a lot of things that are active. So it allows those things to actually transpire, to actually take place. Um, and then it also, it also uh, softens the wine a little bit. When you have something in that's been only in stainless steel its entire life, you can sometimes tell you're like, this is like sharp and it's like, it's edgy and it's, you know, it's just like literally you will just have this like, imagine instead of a, a hard square, you just round the edges off of the square. So even if you have something acidic, you know, like Hohenbart, it just, it rounds the edges a little bit. Now, when you have different amounts of newer oak, that's when you have different flavors that start coming in where you actually have like vanilla flavors are the most prominent mocha espresso depending on how much the oak was toasted on the inside um, so that's when you have it actually impacting the flavors so there's the well you got to put the wine somewhere while it ages <laughs> and it rounds it out different flavors to the wine does that make sense right and to clarify chris we we most of the time go with neutral yeah like you know some wines uh i mean it's rare that we go above like 20% new oak, like sometimes wines take to it well and we think it needs it and therefore we give it. Like I really do just try to follow what I feel the wine wants to do more than anything else. That's another interesting point too, because some grape varieties just lend themselves to absorbing mm -hmm. oak better. Yeah, so Cabernet loves oak, you know, and not, not everybody that drinks Cabernet loves oak as much as some people that are producing it loves it. Uh, but, you know, like usually when we, when we make Cabernet, there's, you know, like 10 to 20% new oak on it because it takes it well, like it tastes better with the oak than it does without. So, and it also has bigger tannins that rounds it off a little bit more, that kind of stuff too. That was a good question, Darcy. Thank you. Um, Chris, we have a quick question. So by the way, uh, just so you don't, you don't get away with this, uh, yeah. by the way, uh, Craig, uh, Craig and April right there. They're also wine professionals. Craig is a fellow master sommelier and April runs a brokerage in Texas. So, but go ahead and bring it. <laughs> but, but mostly we're just Chris Miller fans. Yeah, we, we, we know each other for 20 years. By showing up tonight. <laughs> yeah. So I want to know Big what fans. you're drinking. Big fans. <laughs> so. Um, Lots of questions. Our, unfortunately our wine shipment didn't show up because of the whole Texas thing that's been happening. Uh, but I have a question about the Columbard, which I've had once. Um, what is your favorite attribute for that wine? You know, I like that it's, for me, it's, it's kind of like Pinot Grigio without making an excuse for drinking Pinot Grigio. So when you're, when you're a wine, like when you're a wine professional, you're supposed to be really snobby about it and that kind of stuff. But like Pinot Grigio is refreshing. It's easy to drink. It's lighter bodied. And, you know, it's something you just keep a bottle in the fridge and just pop it whenever, whenever you don't want to think too much. So the Cullen Bar, like, gives you permission to have that moment, almost, which is weird. Like, why would I need permission to drink anything? Um, but it's, it's kind of, it's easy in that way. But there's also a little bit more of this earthy tone to it. It reminds me of, uh, actually, of Silvaner, which is a lesser known uh, German grape, uh, a little bit. It has just, like, this earthy tone. There's something interesting to it. But it's you know light bodied, easy to drink, refreshing. Uh, but there's still a little something there. So and that's where my story about the Columbard uh, always comes in. That Chris handed me a bottle and was like, "You got to drink this. It's so good. We've been drinking it at the winery all the time. You got to try it." I don't always spend time up there, so he was like, "Take it home, drink it." Well, time got away from me. A couple of weeks passed. He had checked in. I was like, "I'm so sorry. I hadn't had the chance." He's like. I promise it's like, it's so chuggable. You're going to love it. One night I remember, oh, I have that chilled. I should drink that. 
And it led to 15 minutes after opening it, texting Chris at 11 PM, my boss and going, wow, you were not kidding. This is that drinkable. Holy cow. I need more of it. And he was like, well, what did I tell you? I told you to drink it sooner. So I think the chuggable aspect, like you said, Chris, you, you sometimes feel you need this permission, but sometimes it's good to just drink an easy bottle of delicious, easy to drink wine, you know? Yep. That's what I love about this label specifically and your bold label is you make them so um, approachable and accessible through the price points that like, I don't think most people would gravitate towards a columbard off the grocery store shelves and be like, yes, I know exactly what that is. And I want to buy six bottles of them because I know it's amazing. But through smaller wine clubs like this and little shops and restaurants that I'm sure have picked up your wine, um, we're able to introduce the masses to really cool varieties <laughs> like this. Yeah, it's it's sort of got like like the best of both sides of the coin for us. Like it's, it's outside of what people are normally encountering. It's really refreshing. It's a new experience and people can afford to pay for it and they're not going to freak out over the price point. So it's just like, it's an awesome wine. Yeah. Can I jump in with a question, Gina, quickly? Of course. I'm just really curious how, because obviously a lot of winemakers are not Psalms or even Psalms, let alone a master Psalm. So I'm just curious how you think that, like, do you think that has affected how you make wine? And do you think it like makes you a different wine kind of winemaker than someone who hasn't done those kind of studies? Uh, if you're asking if I'm bipolar, yes. <laughs> uh, it has made me bipolar. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's a great question. And one actually that I don't, I don't get as much as I thought I'd get. Like, um, it's, it's interesting. Like I literally, and this is just kind of the way, maybe the way I think as well, but, um, I, I literally have this moment. I just like kind of remove myself and I think about it from a song and then I put that away and I just wear a different hat and I think about it as a winemaker. And there's moments where I'm talking to other winemakers and I'm like, Ugh, whatever, or like, I'll, I'll relate to them. And then my song brain will kick in. And I'm like, Phew. And then, you know, when I, <laughs> as a song, like I'll, I'll be thinking about a wine and then my winemaker, Thing will kick in and you're just like oh that's not well no they probably did this and that so it's it actually gets a little a little weird at times um so i generally like i honestly try to segment that as much as possible where it's just like yep i'm i'm making the wine and this and that and i have an idea of where it wants to go and i'm just true to that and then when i get into the final blending because you could take you know the grapes off a of vineyard and let's say it's the same exact varietal same vineyard picked on the same day and one of them is 50 feet over you know and it's like or it's downhill from the other one and you bring it in especially when you're dealing with like native yeast fermentations like the barrels will actually taste different from one another let's say you have six barrels of this wine three of them taste alike two of them kind of taste like each other and then one of them is an outlier and you're just like what the hell is going on here because they just kind of go their different ways like they ferment at different rates or you know, like, oh, well, that one was in that corner of the cellar and it's a little bit warmer. So it went drier two days earlier, you know, in fermentation and it actually tastes different. Um, so when I'm in the blending process, like I'll go through that and then I'll kind of flip back and forth between the winemaker and saw that. But I try to avoid it as much as possible until it's like, you know, that kind of thing. Or if I'm doing an event, then I'll just like, I'll look at it as a psalm. Like, but yeah, it's it, it gets weird at times. Or, you know, that's also like part of how like, and a draw started where just like, oh, you know, it'd be so cool. We should totally make this. Like nobody's making that. And then it's just like, oh, like the Columbard, it is a pain in the ass. Like I have to rent a big truck. I have to bring my own picking crew. It's in Central. It's like three, three and a half hours away from the winery. So like I go there, I get a cheap hotel outside of Modesto, which outside Modesto, cheap motel. Like we've had somebody's rims on their car get stolen. It's like, who steals rims now? Like what? You know, it's like, it's weird. I'm like, I guess I pay for that. Like, it feels wrong not to, you know, for one of my employees. So just like, you know, like, you know, last year we slept in the truck because we only had like three hours anyway before the picking crew. So you just like sleep in the truck so nobody steals the wheels off of it. <laughs> and then like, then you're dealing with like a whole day of picking and then you truck it back to the winery and then you make it that same day. So it's like a 32 hour day, 
you know, where you're just like, yeah, doing all the things like it is a complete pain, but I'm like, dude, but we can make Columbard for like, you know, like cheap. And like, everybody else is like, oh, that's cool, Chris. Like, ha ha. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so when it comes down to like that kind of stuff, I usually, I take the brunt of it because it doesn't feel right to put that on like the other people that work with us. So it's just like, yeah, or like just the little tedious things like, oh, we should totally do this. And they're like, that adds 12 hours of work and nobody else is going to know except for you. Like, yeah, yeah, but I don't know. And it's bad. So. But Melanie, I will, I'll expand from the outside point of view. You can almost see the shift in Chris when he goes into MS mode, because as a winemaker, like you said, he's like, roll up his sleeves. Like he'll get in those grapes. Like, okay, someone's got to do this. Like I'll scrub the floors. Like I'm a winemaker. And then all of a sudden we're tasting through the newest lineup and suddenly he's nose in glass, like scribbling down his notes. And I'm like, who, weren't you just scrubbing the floors of the winery a second ago? So it's so funny to see the chasm between the, uh, like the apex of, of what wine tasting is and then just Chris Miller winemaker. It's, it's very funny. So yes, he does have two personalities. Oh, I mean, you're one person, Chris, don't worry about that. It's not your- No, he's definitely multiple personalities. And Melanie, <laughs> if I could just jump in and add one thing real quick. Um, as I've been doing this for over 20 years and Chris and I are good, good buddies. And I will say that it is evident to me when I taste wine professionally, I can easily pick out a wine that a sommelier made versus a wine that a, a traditional winemaker made. And the difference that I personally see is that a wine that is crafted by a sommelier, not only a master sommelier, but a sommelier in general, is typically lighter in body and has more acid. It's a little more fresh. It's a wine that I actually have two glasses of rather than just one, uh, because a sommelier is always in their mind. They're always thinking, "What am I going to eat when I have this in my mouth?" And winemakers traditionally are thinking, "What is the most explosive thing that I can have the most consumer appeal immediately?" And that's the big difference that I see when I taste a sommelier's wine versus a, a traditional winemaker's wine. And then to yeah, I want to let you know I was here. You know? <laughs> I was going to say to triple piggyback on that, it absolutely comes into conversation in my presentation if I'm showing Chris's wines, because I it is an important part of his story to tell. And to, and to what Craig just said, absolutely, because I feel like you taste his wines and they're meant to go with food. You can have a glass on their own, but they're absolutely going to be great with food as, as well. Well, thank you, everyone. That was fascinating. We've watched like all the Master Psalm documentaries and everything. So I'm just fascinated by the process and everything you guys put yourself through. Okay. So And that answer also <laughs> made me think that probably not a lot of sommeliers make big Napa Reds. Uh, cabs, if you're saying that they typically are lighter in body. That's why I love this one. Uh, yeah, I can't think of any. We've got yeah. one in Los Olivos. Almost true. But uh, Barbieri, what's his first name? Oh, uh, Renee? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, he's making cab out of Santa Barbara County. So slightly different than a, a big Napa cab. Cooler weather yeah. cab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you had a, a final question, or not a final question, but one more question. Oh, yeah, 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 I did, actually. Well, Chris, there's something that you said earlier about how cool it is to work with vines that are that old and how they, they kind of take care of themselves. And uh, I just, um, I've never had anyone really articulate to me why that's special, you know, what um, what the impact of that is. And I'm really curious what that actually does to the agriculture, like how it makes the cultivation process different and, and how your expectations of the grapes that are gonna come off the vine are different. Um, like I've, I've always heard it said that it's something to be sought after, but I've never asked the question or have anyone explain why. Sure. So the, you know, there's a couple of non-scientific reasons why it's special and I'll get through those first. Um, you know, first of all, you're dealing with heritage where things have been around for a long time and that's just kind of cool on its own. Um, I mean, these grapes have been through like, talking about like Dust Bowl era type stuff, you know? So it's just like, wow, it's, it's actually seen some yeah. things. Wow. Um, and there's not a lot of it. So scarcity and what have you. Now from, you know, getting a little bit into the scientific dipper and toe in the water, 
there's a reason that these grapes have been in that place that long and weren't ripped out for almond trees or for grazing land and that somebody actually cared for them because you know over a century's time somebody went out there and making wine from this every year they're like this is a good idea this is the best use of this place so there's this kind of like vetting process you can leave all the pr bs behind with like this is the greatest vineyard site that's ever been known to man because we scouted it out and it's here and it's there and we got we got the geologist in and they said it's a special subsoil it's like great like this person's been doing it for 200 years doesn't necessarily mean that it's great but somebody bothered for a reason and if you're going to do something for 100 years or 200 years probably a decent reason behind it so there's that kind of vetting process for the scientific reason um once you get vines starting around like 12 to 15 years of age uh we generally old vines like the youngest old vines are like 30 40. once you get to like 12 15 years of age like the vines just start to manage themselves a lot more um that's when you start to see dry farming become a lot easier the roots dig down deeper and it honestly just manages itself like the nutrient uptake that it needs is it's just being very efficient at the same time so you again this gets into like sustainability practices this gets into dry farming this gets into intervening as little as possible with the nature where you know they could actually not tend to this vineyard for an entire year not even clip anything back and we go out there and it like be a little bit of pain in the harvest but like probably get some decent grapes out of it still even with nobody interfering with it whatsoever even so much as pruning Thank you for that, man. I, yeah. that is like, it, it really is fascinating to me. I, I have like a little bit of a, I, an inkling that a lot of it was going to be related to sort of how efficient the, the vines were at that point at acquiring the water and the nutrients they needed, but yeah, yeah. I've never had anyone articulate that. Um, so I'm going to cop to something. Uh, I, I just switched over to drinking uh, the Gamay uh, about a minute and a half ago. And it's absolutely bonkers. That's a, an industry term. Yeah. It, yeah it, official <laughs> official industry term. Um, sure, I used chuggable a minute ago. So, you know, bonkers, <laughs> chuggable. Although chuggable is a Chris Miller classic. He loves that one. Yeah. There's just, there's so much going on with this. Like I'm, I'm, I'm picking up like just this vast variety of stuff that is so interesting and it's so poppy for a gamay. Like this is just, this is a killer wine, man. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. So I just wanted um, to say that um, with older plants in general, but the vines, I would think that you'd have a, a more complex mineral content. You know, yeah, they're bringing in, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people like talk about the complexity of everything. Like I wanted it, you know, in answering, I wanted to give like things where they absolutely can prove it. But you're right, like a lot of people talk about the complexity of it, the density of it. Uh, generally with older vines, you see yield start to go down. Like instead of having to go through the vineyard and actually trim things back, it just stops putting out as much. So it actually limits its own vigor, which is great as well and leads to concentration in the grapes. But that's getting into like, and it's very like, it's been witnessed and documented a million times over, but for, for grapes and how that translates into the wine, some people treat it as, you know, pseudoscience and some treat, treat it as absolute truth, so. Um, so just with respect to everyone's time and your time as well, I, I have two questions for you, Chris. Um, one specifically about the Gamay. Um, what made you choose to do carbonic maceration for this wine as opposed to a typical fermentation and then I'll finish up with my final question after that. Sure. Um, you know, for this one, uh, we actually, we weren't going to make Gamay this year. Uh, we had plenty going on. It's the last thing we needed. Um, but I went into a vineyard and I was actually scouting another portion of this same vineyard. And they had this huge hill and it's all granite, which is uh, where Beaujolais comes from. It's, it's mostly granite uh, there, the best, the top Beaujolais. So it was just like, and they had all these head trained vines on it. And it was just like an impossible vineyard. And I looked up at it and I know the owners now and they bought it like 20 years ago. And I'm like, we we're kind of looking at it, kind of laughing. I'm like, oh yeah, 
then your manager definitely got fired for that one. <laughs> like just looking at it because like makes no sense. It's far too hard to farm. Like I won't even I won't even walk the vineyard. Like you're gonna fall and just tumble down and break your neck. Like it's it's bad, bad. Like you need hiking gear. And just like you look at it like nobody should have planted that. And in some counties, it's illegal to like plant on those kind of slopes because of erosion and what have you. Not as much a they don't get rainfall there. But it's just like, yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, so we went out there and I found this place and it was really head trained vines, old granite hill. And it was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's make some wine from it. And we got it in and, you know, anytime we, anytime we're approaching a vineyard and this is also, again, like first few years and we figure some stuff out and then maybe it goes to Seabold. Like, and I still reevaluate all the grapes that come in every single year. So every bin that comes in, I literally just sit there and I take a few minutes and everybody knows not to bother me. And I just take a few minutes and I take 10, 20 minutes and I actually taste through I look at the stems, look at the grapes. I, you know, eat a few, kind of go through it. And I kind of, you know, start thinking about where I think this wine wants to go. And then I try to help it get there. So when we got this, I was like, well, it was very dark fruited. Um, it was on the richer kind of denser side. And I mean, it's low yield and vines on a granite hill. So like that makes some sense. I was like, yeah, but I don't want it this, I don't think it wants to be just this like big base note. That's not what Gamay wants to do. That's not what this vineyard wants to do. So having some of it go into a carbonic space to add like those kind of lifted aromatics where this has a broader range of a fruit profile where we actually get like red and blue fruit in this. And you get like some of like, those kind of like natural spices out of it as well from the whole cluster. And it made it, you know, I kind of did the math beforehand and I was just like, well, I think this is going to be the more complete wine. I think this is where this wants to go. And, you know, we did some of this where we actually did not do carbonic on it. You know, we did like one bin that way and it was a deep, rich, dense wine, not without its charms, but it more closely resembled like Syrah or something a lot heavier. So, you know, having this combination where we did this like partial carbonic, I think brought out its best attributes. Awesome. I saw that Craig had a question. The Craig circle light to raise your hand. I wanted to say that he respects your winemaking and your tasting ability so much. And he was just wondering, what's your favorite pairing of Siebold wine and food? Wow. That like, I haven't really thought it. Well, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's pretty... You will have to lower our hand because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> a year of zooms and we still can figure it out. <laughs> oh, you did it! You become a cat. <laughs> uh, I have the power. Uh, that's really interesting. You know, honestly, um, I probably have to stay. Uh, we like one of the things that I love making and. It's, it's one of those grapes that I think like, unfortunately not as many people spend enough time with, but I love making Grenache um, because it's such a pain in the ass in the cellar and it's horrible and it will break your heart and it'll change colors in the barrel. Like you go there one day and it's orange and you go back and the next day it's red. You're like, why did this get darker? today you know and you're just like I don't understand and like one day it's like crappy and then uh, you get back like this is it stabilizes after about a year but the first time that I made Grenache it was just like a roller coaster of a ride and it was just like wow like I need to stop paying attention to the wines on a daily basis because it'll just rip you to shreds you literally go like this is the most delicious thing ever and you're like I'm a terrible winemaker this is died <laughs> today and then like three days later he's talking yeah, so uh, like Grenache with pork, like it's one of my favorite things, like this kind of white pepper thing. So, you know, you do roasted pork. I'm probably also thinking about that because that's what we're having tonight. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like seared pork chops, that kind of thing where it's, you know, like just really, really not too heavy. Cause like, what do you do with pork? Do you do Pinot? Do you do something heavier? It's fatty. Grenache still has good acidity if you're growing it in the right places, but it has this, you know, like, big fruity personality that actually just matches really well with it. So that's probably my favorite. Although, you know, um, you know, Syrah with, you know, like barbecue pork ribs or something like that is pretty incredible. So 
Uh, my business partner actually is, he's from Texas and he makes nice. pretty great barbecue. So, and that's the best way to start a fight with other Texans where Craig and April are. They're not, they're not big barbecue errs at home. Uh, We're but also he's not big fighters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, I was that the last time uh, we enjoyed Seabold with Chris, we actually had a uni pasta and we had Seabold Chardonnay with uh, uni pasta and that was pretty killer. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a good night. That yeah, that was good. Like the perfect pairing. Um, so in my smooth and not so smooth transition, my final question is um, what made you decide to work with a distributor? Um, what in incentivized you to kind of want to branch out a little bit with your sales? Tell us how you met um, or started working with Lee at the source. Sure. Um, I started working with a distributor because selling wine is horrible. <laughs> And I like it's making fun. wine and I have so, so much respect. Like when you're, when you're, when you're a Psalm and you're, you know, a salesperson, every single person, and I worked at a busy restaurant and it had, you know, a great reputation. And so, you know, everybody was coming to sell me wine. They would be like, you know, like everybody's like, oh, thank you for the appointment. This is so amazing. You're tasting my wine. It's so great. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it is great that I'm tasting your wine. Yeah, damn straight. <laughs> you know, and they're just like, they're selling this and you're like, oh yeah, like knock a few bucks off of that. You're like, yeah. And then you can send it to me. And it's, it's great. Being a wine buyer is wonderful. It's so amazing. I loved it so much. And then you're on the other side of the appointments. You're like, this is terrible. I worked for years on this. I don't need your opinion on this. Like, <laughs> what do you mean cheaper? Like I'm losing money. You know, like you, you just have these things. Like it's, it's terrible selling wine. And I know that I like making wine a lot more than I like selling it, frankly. Um, and I have an insane amount of respect for the people that are very good at selling. And I, I used to sell wine on the, on the floor at the restaurant and that kind of stuff. And that's different. And it's still like personal and this thing stuff and relaying the stories. And you know, I was very passionate about it, but, you know, on that kind of business to business kind of level, it's, it's hard. Um, and in some States, you know, a lot of States it's, it's mandatory to sell through distributors. Uh, we call California a cowboy state because you can just pretty much do whatever you want. Um, you know, but in a lot of states, you have to go into that. And frankly, there's just not enough time. Like, you know, I was selling our wine for, you know, the first year and a half of the winery, two years. And it's like, okay, like I'm filling up the barrels. I'm topping the wine and like everything's good at the winery. I got to do this next week. But like, okay, is everything good? Everything good here? Okay, I'm going to go sell it now. And then you like, you run out the door and you try to like take all the appointments and you're dealing with all the emails and like just the emails, like setting up your days. Like I'm going to go onto the market. I'm going to work in this place. I'm going to show these wines then trying to set up all the appointments with all the buyers, keeping track. If it's, if it's not that person's business, like wine buyers move between accounts all the time. So trying to keep track of all that is it's nerve wracking, particularly if you're not doing it 52 weeks out of the year. So when you're a small wine producer and you have maybe 12 weeks out of the year to devote to wine selling, that's not going to get the job done. So you, you kind of have to work with, you know, and frankly, I'm not good at it. I am okay, like, but I'm not great at selling wine yet. I hope to be one day, like, you know, and like do market bits, this and that, but like the follow up, the follow through, all the different things, all the different boxes to check, all the different emails to go through. It's, it's a lot of work and it's not something to be taken lightly as like, oh yeah, I'll just do that in my spare time, you know, so. Well, I also think it's a great example of Chris is the quintessential small business owner who's willing to do, willing to do everything himself. But, not always able, but I'm uh, Right, able. but well, that's my point. I mean, people, like everyone admires small business owners because they really do roll up their sleeves and, and get down to it. But also from the outside, it's so easy to say, well, just ask for help. Just get someone to help you handle that. So I feel like that's where people like Lee come in and they, they help, they help people like Chris do what Chris should do better because then he can focus on his thing and not try and run around and go sell the wine after topping all the barrels, that sort of idea. Yeah, I mean, we we consult on a few vineyards and we actually do manage a few things. But when it gets into like deep nitty gritty on viticulture, I'm like, I'm out, I'm out. Call somebody else. Like, nope. We, I am always willing. Like, we have now transcended the limits of my abilities. It's time to call in somebody better. 
And I have no ego about it. Just small business reality. She's like, nope, you're better. You do it. You're in charge. <laughs> like, I, have, I have no problem. Like Katiana is in charge of a lot of things now that I started. And I'm just like, nope, you're better. You're in charge. Well, what do you think? Like, doesn't matter. <laughs> That's a big conversation. Chris, I'd love your input. You got it. I believe in you. You got this. You you know it, handle it. So that's where we talk at. about it. You can you can call me. You can talk. I'll pay attention. I'll <laughs> listen, but like I'm not gonna add anything. You know, I'm worthless. But that's so why for some things like- that like I do a lot of stuff in the winery, and then some things are just like, no, nope, I'm you're better at it, you're in charge. People like Lee are so great because they do, they, they give small business owners the exposure. And like the, like Chris said, like, you know, in certain States, you can't even get access to Seabolt without someone like Lee in the middle. So it's like such a great, you know, perfect middleman to get bottles in the hands of important people who want to taste it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in, in perfect final transition, Chris, we want to thank you and Katiana so, so much for coming on this little behind the bottle journey with us. If you have to pop off, totally fine. Um, But um, we do want to get into Lee's discussion um, of the importers and distribution section to kind of complete the little loop of uh, what- Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait. Go ahead, Dusty. I just, I have to say something about this gamay. (laughs) I I cannot let it go. Normally I stay silent on these and you know, Gina no, and Aaron, I just, I, I, I just want to support silent. you guys. And um, I got these, I got these bottles. Uh, Gina and Aaron brought them down to me on our last bottling. And um, I got to say, this is one of the best domestic MAs I've ever had. Um, Thanks, man. It, it, it toes the line between a Nouveau and a Cru Beaujolais like nothing I've ever had. Um, it has this, you know, you can definitely see the carbonic in it, um, but it has like this rustic bubblegum aspect to it that just takes it to another level. And it is, it, it's unbelievable. I, I, it took me four minutes to find the, the vintage on the bottle, um, <laughs> but it, it's a 19 and, um, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it, it's when I opened it, it was just, um, it's stunning. It's a stunning wine. And I, I don't say that lightly. Um, Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. It, it's a fine job. And I don't think everyone on the call should really appreciate how well done this wine is. It, it's fantastic. So, so Thanks. full disclosure to Diamond Mount, um, Dusty's been texting us about this wine for the last 20 minutes, <laughs> like as we've been going through the conversation. So, Sorry to put you on blast, man, but I'm right there with you. I love this yeah. wine. This is a fantastic it's, wine. It's really, it's really good. It, it's a, it's an effort that should be um, applauded. Uh, I, I don't see many of these very often, and it's very cool to see it uh, now uh, coming out of California. Oh, yeah. How long good. would you, how long would you age this? Because of like the mix aging or the mix uh, carbonic and. You know, that's a, that's honestly, that's a really super interesting question. Um, short answer is I'm not quite sure. Like I know it'll go a solid three, five years. I know it'll do that. Like, you know, I've, I've been making wine since 06, 07. I can see things in the wine. Like it'll go there. Like there's enough tannin, there's enough vats of support behind it. It had a good deal of skin contact. The carbonic's not overwhelming. It's going to change in one to three years and be something else. And I don't know that it'll be better than this. It'll be different. And I think it'll be closer to a crew. I I think there's enough stuffing behind it that it'll age closer to the crew, but not be super long lived. So I'd probably say like, it's gonna start changing another 18 to 36 months. And I know it'll go and be in a good place for a year or two after that. And then it'll keep going the next five to 10 years, but I don't know that it'll be better for it. Does that make any sense? It does, thank you. Yeah. So I was gonna say it's definitely a glue glue, but it's actually too good to chug. Like you you (laughs) want to slow down and enjoy it, so. Chug it, I'll make more. I got the 2020 in barrel, it's fine. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Chug it. it. 
Check it. You gotta then it's it. good to wine her in first. Ears if you're having a bad day, whatever. You know, Watch out, your they're gonna finish it out of the kegs first at the winery. I'll have to make and bottle it and sell it. Um, so this is a perfect time to transition over to Lee and my, one of the coolest things in our experience with Lee has been, she was introduced to us through a mutual friend, um, who's one of our wine club members. Can't believe it took him so long to actually introduce us, but finally, I mean, he's fired as a friend. We're friends now. So, um, <laughs> he introduced us and said, you guys just, you're going to be friends, carry on. And she started very quickly bringing us amazing wine samples and very quickly understood exactly what we like. And when she introduced us to Chris's wines, she, it's like she almost, she didn't even talk about it. She's just like, drink this. And I've, I, we trusted her at that point. We basically, everything she brings us, we buy because it's just so easy. Everything that she carries is fantastic. And, um, yeah, so she, I mean, she delivered these to us and she's like, you're going to like them. You're, you're going to, you're going to enjoy them. And of course, here we are now all just oogling over, ogling over this wine. Um, but Lee, can, tell us, tell us about the source. Tell us about Vance wine selections and how, how you bring wine to people like us, like retailers. For sure. And I have to say, I think it started with the village, Chris. They, these guys were just like pining for a pet gnat. And <laughs> I bugged you. I was like, can we just get them one more case? And so you, you were talking about sales. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a matchmaker. You know? Yeah, I, that's, that's what all the great salespeople say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not here to sell you anything. Just, you know, I just brought some things by. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, I wouldn't, yeah, I just, it, that's, that's part of my joy is making those connections where it's like, oh my gosh, I, I just know that your wines are going to be a match for what uh, Gina and Aaron are doing and really enjoy doing that. I do want to point out too, if you guys have not seen Chris's bold and Seabold labels, the Dois labels are definitely a major departure. And so I think they're just kind of telling you like, drink me, just drink me now. Don't take me seriously. And, and I love Dusty that you're like, I had to look at the bottle, but if you look at the labels very closely at, at each of those wines, they tell you everything that, at, that you need to know about them. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, this is where it's from. Super small case production too. I think the Gamay is what, like 117 cases? Somewhere around there. That, yeah. yeah so it's like these are special wines so big for chris sometimes too with the dwa sometimes he makes them and they're gone before i can even get my hands on them <laughs> Melissa knows that with the pet nat she keeps begging me for more and i tell her it's gone i breaks my heart <laughs> yeah. well you know i'm not the world's most perfect winemaker either we made about 250 cases worth of gamay we bottled up 113 or whatever it was like you know it's just like well yeah that's not gonna make it so yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's fun stuff for sure. Yeah. And I, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Like I'm, I have to, we got our COVID vaccinations today and I'm in charge of the baby. Get so, out of here. Yeah. The wife's not reacting great to the vaccine. So uh, I've got to do all, all the things, third hat. So thank uh, you so much, so much for being with us, Chris. Oh, Chris, thanks so much for having great. us. Like thank it you. wasn't originally scheduled today. They pushed it back. Like, so yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good night, Chris. Yeah. Right. Thanks, guys. Melissa Thanks. is in the chat trying to ask about Pet Nat again. <laughs> yeah, the Pet Nat was such a huge hit with people. It, it's such an awesome wine. Oh my gosh, it was literally. We did a private tasting with Gina and Aaron, and everyone tried to get it. And I like purposely made Gina like set aside bottles in advance for me. And I was like, "Don't tell my friends. <laughs> Don't tell my friends." That's like, like Lee knew what she was doing. If you lead with the pet nat, I mean, it's game over. And that's why Lee, you make such a good point. Like Chris will give you, you know, trouble, but matchmaking, I mean, that's what you do. Like it, you bring good wine to good people. Yeah. And I I feel so fortunate. I get to work with just awesome people. I really truly love my buyers. It's been a big challenge during COVID is not tasting with them in person. I'm like, I miss my buyers. Like I love just <laughs> sitting down and tasting wines and getting their reactions to them and kind of learning about them together and fun stuff. But yeah. Oh, um, do you want me to touch on the import process in that a little bit? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. And so just so everyone knows, um, the source is 
and you can correct me, Lee, because I'm not I'm not perfect on this. The source is the distribution arm of Vance Wine Selections, which is the importer, or is it the other way around? I that's I don't know. We're I mean our official <laughs> title is is Vance Wine Selections LLC DBA the source imports. So I think they just were set up as an LLC. But basically Ted Vance is, you know, co-owner. He's our tastemaker. He's the one out there that is just fully dedicated his life to wine. Um, just learned from such a young age. I think Chris and Ted had both like passed through Spago as well, like at different times in their careers, just some of the best places. Um, but Ted is out there. He, just visiting all of our producers in Europe, deciding which ones that are in alignment with our business philosophy and and um, and passions, and and we, yeah, we put an order in with the wineries over in Europe, and in a perfect world, they'd take about two months or less to get here and into our warehouse <laughs> during COVID. However, it's, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. Lee, what, what kind of delays did you all see? Like you said, you know, perfect world COVID affects everyone like tasting rooms had closures and wineries had delays. And, you know, how did that affect your branch of things? And that's a great question because the, we've literally had a container sitting at the docks for a month. <sighs> Yeah. So it's like, we're just sitting there. And then they also, if you guys are familiar or not with the tariffs, they slapped another one on late December. So we had had a pallet on the water coming through. And then when it landed, they're like, surprise, you owe us more money. Oh no. It's just, oh, it's, it's, it's a lot that people don't realize goes into it. Um, and then also with that whole, that whole process, you know, getting a wine, say we all take it out throughout the state of California, everyone goes nuts for it. And then we're sold out. Well, it's going to take at least two to three months to get that. So that's a really hard game to play too. It's like, how far in advance do we need to order this wine to have it in stock at all times? Um, so with that, we do import the wines, but then we are also the distributor for them with the source mm -hmm. wines. Um, however, now the source wines are out in different states. So our import arm is working with other distributors in other states selling our wines and vice versa. We work with about half of the Becky Wasserman portfolio um, for Burgundy as you guys all probably are familiar. Um, what else? And then some of the domestics too, you know, we are really an import company, but we love some of our, our friends here in California so much that we just kind of back pocket uh, represent some of them. Um, sometimes we buy them. So that would be, we'd be distributing. And then sometimes we broker them or it's like, Hey, you know, and then so that's a whole <laughs> other topic of, topic of conversation. So um, I, I'm going to present this because I, I think Lee, Lee is probably too modest to, to say anything to this effect, but um, she's just been absolutely instrumental <clears throat> in our ability to really do um, successful virtual tastings like this because Lee is, has spent so much time with us and gotten so good at sort of understanding our palate and the palate of our market um, it, that it makes it possible for us to, to be confident that we're going to be able to access wines that are just incredible on a moment's notice to send out for, uh, for virtual tastings of this type. Um, the transition that we did over into virtual tasting uh, at the beginning of COVID really wouldn't have been possible without her help. So, uh, so much affection for you, Lee, for that. Um, with the, with the, with the praise out of the way, I guess there are a couple of questions in chat that Alyssa posed. Um, just wondering if the tariff that you guys were hit with was that horrible hundred percent tariff and, and maybe how many labels are you representing at this point? Oh, pretty much most of them now. I mean, we represent majority from France, Italy, Austria, Spain, um, Portugal now, because Ted lives there. It's It's been rough. Um, we're really fortunate that our producers in Europe and us have kind of come to, you give a little, we get a, give a little, so we don't have to actually put a 25% price increase on the wines that we sell. Um, it's, I mean, I know I've, I've written um, Padilla and um, Salud Carbajal, our, our local um, congressman here. Just, I know you have bigger, you have bigger things on your plate. <laughs> you just get Biden to like sign an executive order to get rid of the tariff. Um, and then when um, one of my friends made a good point in, you know, 
in why the tariffs are are important to eliminate is because these wines have from Europe have complete context. Like if if they're priced out of California wines at, at the price that they should be should have been at, then you're going to lose context of of what people are making here. Uh, so you you know you the side by side tastings are some of the most important for your whole wine knowledge of you know like this is classic region. Bar Valley is kind of where Chenin Blanc does its thing great and then oh let's just taste that you know let's taste a Chenin Blanc from the central coast of California and see how they compare and they differ and if one is $20 and one is now $35, $40 it's that's gonna be you know it doesn't make sense. Well, right. So Lee, Lee has one of these sayings that is really like anchored in my brain um, that uh, a lot of European wines a lot of French wines provide context to the California wine that we like adore and we enjoy so much on the central coast. That has wormed its way into my brain. Uh, and I <laughs> get it. Um, but I think Alyssa, you had another question. If you want to come off mute, go ahead and fire that one. Fire that okay, one. You were on, on mute. Make, <laughs> make her take all our questions in the chat. <laughs> yes, I'm wondering um, if you, so I've been working with Gina a little bit. Um, and so I, I know a teeny tiny bit about you, but I'm wondering um, of the labels that you represent, do they, do they fall into a particular demographic? Like, do you focus on small production or, you know, boutique wineries or natural, like uh, natural wines? What is, what's your focus, if I'd any? Say, I'd say we're rock nerds. <laughs> um, Ted is just really, really into the bedrock. Um, so it'd be granite, gneiss, slate, all of that. Um, really, but then of course, following with that, just really, I mean, small production, mom and pop wineries that have been in the gen in the family for three, four, five, 11 generations, um, for the most part, really small. I mean, you're not going to find us in grocery stores or anything like that. Um, really our main, our main customers are our restaurants. Um, uh, but yeah, and then farming minimal, minimally sustainable or in France, Luta Resini. Um, to organic, up to certified organic, biodynamic, pra practicing biodynamic and certified biodynamic. But then, and then you go to Europe and then the, <laughs> the, there's just some, <laughs> a whole other world of like categories and certifications. So that could be another, that could be another Zoom. Really yeah, I mean, all of that. And that's why I'm like, I know we're 12 minutes over at this point, but it's, it's such an interesting it's right. such an interesting aspect and element of, of the wine and like how the specific brokers and importers and distributors pick out the wines that they choose to select and how they kind of foster their um, like preferences. It's in, and then how they find the, the buyers like ourselves who are interested in the same thing. It truly is matchmaking. I mean, of course we're all here to make some money and sell the things, but you really have to find the right people to to work with in order to make that dream of yours happen, whatever that dream is. And it's really cool. Exactly. Yeah, this might've been answered already, but um, is there a specific region that you're getting your grapes from in the winemaking regions? For Lee or for Seabold? For Lee. Oh, so Sorry. we, yeah, we actually um, import wines from all over, from Chile to France, to Austria, oh. Italy. Oh, okay. So, but you're not focusing on, uh, you know, like you only do Bordeaux type grapes. Or... And that's a good point too, because as a relatively, to kind of go back to what we were just talking about, as a relatively young company, we're just a little over 10 or I think we're 10 or 11 years old. You got to think that by now, the all of Bordeaux has been picked through, you know, like a lot of Piedmont has been picked through. A lot of the huge well-known winemaking regions have been picked through already. So we're kind of discovering what's up and coming. Um, okay. Obviously, like Galicia, Spain is pretty hot right now. Um, and we're just getting some really cool things out of Northern Portugal as well. Yeah. Um, Mom, to piggyback on that, just for everyone, this, this is my mother, Darcy. I, I'm so glad you came and did this with us. <laughs> uh, the, the economics of wine around the world are really fascinating um, and they vary wildly from country to country. Um, because the inputs are different in terms of the cost of the land and the cost of labor. Um, so you can, you can get uh, very, very different experiences at very different price points. 
Um, but ultimately the other thing that's kind of interesting and at play uh, across the world, which would um, play in, in uh, Lee's favor is climate change, which is fundamentally changing the quality of the products coming out of different places. So, you know, global climate's dynamic. Um, what was the absolute perfect place to grow Pinot Noir 30 years ago may not be the same 30 years from now. Um, so it's, it's an evolving environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then just to kind of round this circle right back around that. Um, so Lee leads into us. Of course, you all know who we are. You've purchased wine through us. Of course, that's how this, this tasting has happened. Um, and I, I don't really know what else to say about the, the retail industry, the retail portion of this, other than it, it consists of bars, restaurants, online wine shops and clubs like ours. Um, but I think probably the biggest lesson I've learned as a retailer now is, of course, it's all about the sale. But um, I think we've demonstrated really well in this tasting tonight that it's not just about the final sale. It's really about the community that we've mm -hmm. built along every step of the way. It's not just about customer service. It's not just about who we're buying wine from. It's not just about, you know, one specific tier of the three tier system, but um, it's really, really important that there's relationships built along the way. So then the final sale, that, that final thing that happens before we ship wine out to our customers is we can totally guarantee that the, the um, wine that's coming from the winemaker from uh, then to the distributor or the importer, and we do purchase wine directly from winemakers as well. Um, it's really important to completely trust the people who you're working with on the back end of the business. And I think that's something, the reason why we're doing this, this kind of sp special tasting tonight is to show you every step of the way, how important it is. And that's, yeah. I would not have guessed that I've been working in the wine industry for eight years now. Yeah. I've managed wine tasting rooms and worked with sales all along the way, but it, it wasn't really until this end of us owning our company that I, I realized how truly important the, all of the behind the scenes work is. Um, and customers don't see that. You see the final product that lands at your doorstep. You see the final product that lands in your glass at a restaurant. And it's, it's really amazing how much work, how much communication and how much trust um, is behind all of that. Yeah. But it, it really is that network of people that is going to expose great wines to good people, you know, because without Chris making the wines, Lee finding them, her partnering with you, you trusting her, then all of, all of your club members trusting you. I mean, it really is, it gives such a human element to something that could otherwise be so stripped and like we talk about sales, but is it really, it's Chris making good wine, Lee appreciating that her giving it to you, you trust her, all of, you know, everyone on this call trusts you. And it's, it's such a human industry that has a product in the, in the midst, you know, it's, it's a way that people can, <laughs> it's the people party. It is. I mean, it's just so much about like everyone on this call could not be here without you, Gina, without you, Lee, or without Chris. I mean, it's such a, like, excuse me for being emotional, but during a pandemic when we can't even see, you know, Alyssa came to our tasting room and saw this half of me and then finally saw me on a Zoom and saw the rest. Um, you know, it's such a beautiful way to remind ourselves that humans are so integrally related to wine, you know, and it's, there's connections from a networking standpoint, but it's like a human network. And that was probably too emotional to talk about wine, but you know. Yeah. And it's such, it's such a joy to be part of an industry that is just like thousands of years old. Yes. Yeah. The old vines and the old people. <laughs> just kidding. We're all fountains of youth. Don't you fret. Don't you fret. Wine one. is, um, uh, what's the, uh, not fermenting. It's um, preserving us. We're, we're well pickled. <laughs> no, we're, yeah, we're getting, we're <laughs> quickly being pickled. Uh, Alyssa, I think you, you said in the chat that you had another nerdy question you wanted to fire off. We're all about nerdy questions. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and this might be, um, I might be exposing some naivete of my own part here, but um, I, I'm, I'm much more familiar with California wines, California wine prices. Um, I recently 
did a little tiny bit of research into um, Burgundy. And I think Lee, I heard you mention that you distribute some Burgundian wines. And I went looking for kind of a range. I was like, I want some AOC wines. I want something that's like Burgundian AOC and then something that's much more like narrow. And I wound up with a $20 bottle of Pinot and a $60 bottle of Pinot, um, both AOC level. The $20 obviously was like the bigger, you know, Burgundy AOC. Um, and it got me thinking, I don't think I could find a $20 bottle of American Pinot. If I, a palatable <laughs> American Pinot, if I went looking. And so I did a quick Google search and it was, why are Burgundy wines less expensive than um, American wines? And everything that came up in the results were, why are Burgundy wines so much more, more expensive? And so it got me thinking like, wait, how was I able to find this $20 bottle of Pinot when I'm usually like calibrated to thinking of Pinots as being 40, 50 plus. So I was wondering if you could comment on um, what's going on there. Did I just get a really shitty bottle? <laughs> <laughs> I think not to put you on the spot, but Dusty might be a, a good one to, to pose that question to. If you want to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I actually I had my mic unmuted and then I put it on mute so that you could answer. But I. It, it's a it's a it's a tough question to answer. Um, there are Burgundian Pinots um, that are AOC. Uh, Burgundy or Burgundy um, that are fantastic that sit on the floor of Burgundy, which is the other side of the highway, um, and they make fantastic wines. Why you can't get a palatable U.S. Pinot for that price point um, is a shame, and I actually I now you know. I hate being self-promoting on these Zooms because that's not why I participate in them. But we actually make a Santa Rita Hills Pinot that's $18. Um, how we do that, the logistics of how we do that. What's that? It's really, really good. Yeah, the, the logistics of how we do that is um, behind the scenes. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I don't need to go into how we do that. Um, but we're able to do it um, through kind of a, a backdoor way. Um, our, in full disclosure, our Dusty Nabor uh, Pinot Noir is $50. And that's because the fruit that we buy for that wine is, is $5,000 a ton. And a common conversion for wine is how much per ton you make you just move the decimal one spot. So if you pay $5,000 a ton, it's $50 a bottle of wine. Um, uh, in NSO, that is our declassified Dusty Neighbor wines. Um, those are wines that don't, as you heard Chris talk about, he makes more Gamay than actually goes in to this um, Gamay that we're trying. Uh, we actually make more Pinot Noir than, make, than goes into the Dusty Neighbor label uh, it, it's a it's a selection process, and those wines that don't make it in get declassified into the NSO label, and we're able to come up with a much cheaper version. Um, however, when you look at across the board the uh, wonderful Pinot producing areas, Russian River Valley, Sonoma, um, Santa Rita Hills, Mendocino, all those areas, if you if you endeavor into those as a winemaker, as a winery, uh, the fruit costs of those, of those vineyards make it prohibitive to make a, a wine that is below, let's, let's use the $20 uh, uh, per bottle mark because that seems to be a, a universal, like anything below that is deemed affordable and anything above that is deemed luxury. Um, it, it makes it really prohibitive, especially if you're working with um, organic vineyards or organic slash biodynamic vineyards. Um, they're going to demand a premium on their fruit. Um, it, it's, it's simply not a uh, business oriented decision to retail that wine for $20. You have to remember 
this whole conversation of distributor, wholesaler, and winery, when a winery um, evaluates their wine and says, okay, this Pinot Noir, I'm going to retail direct to consumer for $50. Um, that means that I, as a winery, if I want to distribute that wine, is going to the distributor for 50% of that. So that means that that wine that I valued at $50 direct to the consumer is going to the distributor for $25. And as a small winery, even to produce a bottle of wine is somewhere in the $10 to $15 range. Um, I'm really cutting it slim um, when you add on all the other expenses of a winery at a $25 bottle of wine. And that's kind of where we have to look at it. Um, not all of our wines are sold direct to consumer. I mean, our winery, about 85% is direct to consumer. A lot of wineries, you know, they're 100% distributor. So when they, when they publish a, you know, a, a, for lack of a better term, an MSRP or a suggested retail price, it can be very expensive, but the winery doesn't see a lot of that a lot of the times. So, you know, getting a, a quality bottle of Pinot Noir for $20 or less is kind of a unicorn. It's really hard to do. Um, and that's just the nature of California real estate, California vineyards, California fruit prices. Uh, you know, we're not going to source fruit out of the Central Valley and get $1,500 a ton fruit so we can bring you $20 Pinot Noir. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be garbage in, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So there's a lot of factors that go on. Um, a lot of producers in Burgundy make several tiers of wine that can kind of make up for that. Um, if you look at some of the big producers like Latour, uh, they're a very common Burgundy producer. They have a village level wine or an AOC level wine that are very cheap. They also make Premier Cru and Grand Cru wines that are very expensive and they can kind of even it out. Um, but it would be very, it'd be very difficult to find a uh, Burgundia AOC wine from a small producer at a high quality uh, for $20. It, it, it would be really difficult to find that. That doesn't mean that you can't find a Burgundy, uh, uh, AOC Burgundy wine that's under $20, that's good. It's just, um, what's that? To get it imported too. Yeah, it's getting imported too. That's all, you add a whole nother level on top of that. So, um, you know, it's just different dynamics are going on. Um, you can also talk about the different levels of, of, you know, village wines, AOC wines, Premier Cru, Ground Cru. When, if you've ever been to Burgundy, those things are small things. You know, when, in, in winemaking, we deal in the last 2% of wine. Um, wine is 85% water and 13, 14, 15% alcohol. And then the last 2% are all those phenolics and all those little tannins and everything else that make up the brilliant wines and the shitty wines. And, and we deal in that tiny 2%. And in, in Burgundy, that's never more on display than talking about the floor of Burgundy, the slight elevations of Burgundy, and then the, the Grand Cru's that, uh, vineyards that make up the best of Burgundy. It's, it's nuance. It's very, very, very small. And um, in California, it can be much bigger. So that's a long roundabout <laughs> way of answering your question. That's a really good point. And I mean, in, like I get so excited when stuff like this comes up in these tastings because that's another topic for another virtual tasting. And like, literally- <laughs> The Burgundy awesome. series. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the point of these kind of behind the bottle tastings that we do. We, we do them, there's no set rule on when we do them. It's like when we come up with a good idea, we're like, oh yeah, that's a great behind the bottle. Um, I just wanted to say I, now we're officially a, a half an hour over time. If anyone has to leave, you can. 
um, including Lee, including Katiana, please, like, we're not holding you to any time, but just as Aaron and I, we are here until all the questions are, are being done, being answered. Have been answered. <laughs> yeah, thank so, you so much, Katiana and Lee, for going over with us and, and indulging us and all the questions we got asked. This was super fun. Yeah. Um, one final, or one final just remark, and then, of course, questions are welcome after that, but um, if you wanted either of these wines, the Colombard or the Gamay, we have uh, more to sell if you wanted more. Um, if you were interested in tasting anything outside of these from um, Chris, meaning any of the other Adwa wines or the Seabold wines or the Bold wines, Aaron's going to put the link in um, the chat. So you're and I'm also, um, Gina, I'm going to throw my email in there too. Uh, as I described to Gina, I get to do all fun things, Seabold. So you can go to the website and order like a boring person, or you can reach out to me and see what, what strings I can pull and fun things I can do. And Katiana is so amazing. And she, I mean, she is the director of customer ex uh, experience, but she's so much more than just that title. And she's been the one who's been kind of behind the scenes and Lee, of course, um, in all of this. So she's the one who makes sure that you as a customer gets the best experience. So yeah, she's a good person to email. As I, well. I wrangle Chris, as you notice, he's a, he's a father and a husband and a winemaker. And a, so I grab him and shove him in front of things. <laughs> Lee's been so accommodating. I appreciate her. She's been so great patiently waiting while Chris rambles about who knows what chemistry wise. Lee's got the interesting stuff. She'll get you the wine. That's who I want to talk to. Yeah. And then well, I did just want to. I'm going to duck out. So oh, thanks okay. for having me. But um, if you have any quick questions, just Gina, just shoot me a text and I'll text you back. Okay, sounds good. Um, I, I did just want to say if anyone wanted to purchase the Adwa wines, they are not on the 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 um, website that Aaron put in the chat. So that's when you should email um, Katiana if you wanted them out, if you wanted other of the Adwa wines outside of the Columbard and the Gamay that we have tonight. Um, but yeah, so with that, ask any final questions. We're, we're here. Um, I was going to ask hypothetically, if you were a small boutique <laughs> winery starting out, <laughs> um, how does it work with distribution between states? Uh, I assume that's for me, just clarify. Sure, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. We just, yeah. well um, that is the most loaded question to start with. Um, I will say um, relationships are really valuable. You want to get set up with a distributor who has, has great placements themselves. Um, and then also is going to be a great champion of your wines. Um, the sources is, is, you know, transitioning their focus a bit more towards importing, but um, like as a domestic partner, they, you know, they were the ones that introduced us to Gina, right? Like we would have never had that opportunity had we not, you know, had that relationship with Lee first. So you want to find a distributor who matches your needs as a winery um, and is genuinely excited because, you know, Lee was mentioning she's got all kinds of clients, all kinds of labels, that sort of thing. And, and if she's not genuinely excited about what you're making, it's not going to be the first thing she offers, you know, when she's looking for a placement. Um, additionally, state, statewide, uh, you know, the license process, um, to be able to ship and sell your wines is a whole other thing that I quite frankly, don't know that we have the time to get into today, um, either in time or in budget. Um, it is no small feat, um, to, to be able to ship to some of these states and, and distribute to, to them as well. So, I would say um, it's great to get a good team and I'll, you know, I was, I was joking about it to a degree, but, but really Chris is a great example of a small business owner who's really passionate about what he does. And as a result, sometimes takes on too much and is working to give things to other people and delegate. So um, you know, if you're starting out a business, the best thing to do is build a team you can rely on and that wants the best for you and, and that sort of idea. So that would be my snippet of advice is, you know, the source was a great partner because not only did they themselves have, you know, a network of places that they could distribute, but they were a good fit for us as Siebel's and they were interested in doing the things we were doing. Right. So 
that's like my little tiny little nugget of um, insight I can give to a hypothetical, hypothetical only. This is all hypothetical information. Natalie, just to piggyback on that, um, another great way to find, so that's one portion of, of the answer to that question. Another is, and something that I often do as a retailer who's looking for another winemaker or another um, importer distributor that I want to work with because there's there's always just a, I'm always looking, I need more, you know, there's more <laughs> wine to buy and consume. And um, a great way that I have found to kind of find the right people to purchase wine from is to literally go to a restaurant that I know that I like, or on, if you want, if you're into social media, find that account, whether it be a restaurant or a club or whatever, that, that kind of lines up with what you as the hypothetical winemaker, and I'm just going to shout you out, Natalie, you're a winemaker. This is not a hypothetical question. <laughs> um, but that, that is a, it's a great question. And so it's, um, find people who kind of line up with what you're producing right. and then contact those people. So if, if we're, if Aaron and I are at a restaurant sure. and like Sama Sama is a great example. Um, we're in Santa Barbara. There's a really fantastic Indonesian fusion restaurant called Sama Sama and every single wine on their list is amazing. And I know that Lee perfectly sources food. perfectly mm -hmm. paired. Lee, I found this out after we had been working with her. I, I looked at their wine list and I'm like, Lee sells those. And so it just goes to say that like you find the places that you gravitate towards and that kind of uh, go towards the message that you're trying to send through your wine and then everything mm -hmm. else will kind of follow. I will say one less romantic part um, is that everything takes far longer than you think and is far more expensive than you could ever imagine. And I'll <laughs> say that with a smile. Um, it is fun and it is wonderful that we're able to provide our wines everywhere. It is laborious and it is expensive. So, you know, that's, that's some of the tasks you take on as a small business. Um, and it's kind of the price you pay to really care about something, right? Um, and and put yourself out there. But yes, it's it's both wonderful and expensive and time consuming. So that that's my other snippet. But really, what Gina said, just just find your people, find this is find the vibe that you're going for. Quite frankly, um, and just kind of roll with with that to a degree. I see we've got something I else. would say as a consumer, we got around that when we used to live in Hoboken, New Jersey, and New Jersey has like notoriously awful laws for distributing. Um, I got them shipped to my office in New York, which was good because I, I, I took them, you know, cross border. And then also everyone at work knew that I liked wine. So then I got wine gifts for Christmas. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love that for you. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. We're able currently to ship to all 50 states, but that is, um, no fun, no fun adventure to go on. But yes, loopholes. We love loopholes and we love Hoboken. My husband went to school in Hoboken, New Jersey. He does undergrad there and he adored it. Oh, Darcy wants to know about Natalie. Natalie, you, this hypothetical is no longer. You've been exposed. Right. Right. Break uh, it <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to get down the, the, the gist of what, what we are. And, um, but we ha started making wine this year at a custom crush pad. And I understand that it's just in the same complex as you, Dusty. So I need to, I've been wanting to stop by, but this pandemic won't, uh, <laughs> won't stop. Yeah. We're um, at Camarillo custom crush. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, that's actually down the road from me. Okay. In, in the same complex. So the, uh, the only thing in my complex is a karate studio. And, and little We're kids in the basement. Right. That's, 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 that's the, um, the crushing is done by hand at their facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small <laughs> children. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I do know Camarillo Custom Crush. That's totally fine. Uh, anytime you want to come by, we're right down the street. Just hit me up. Gina knows where, Gina knows where to find me. Um, I'm happy to have you guys over and Love talk through whatever whatever aspect of the business you want to talk through. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I've been drilling over the website, so I just want to trip over there. 
Not um, on the tiniest world. I'm from, I was born and raised in Camarillo, California. Come on. Oh, nice. <laughs> what? Aaron that is ridiculous. Like, that's no, I, I'm, I'm a Thousand Oaks kid. So. My husband is from Newberry <laughs> Park. Oh what? my gosh, you guys. Tiniest little world. It's literally right like here. a jump away. <laughs> <laughs> How are those? Well, you said Camarillo, and my face lit up because no one in their right mind ever talks about Camarillo, California. <laughs> my my mother's <laughs> posting in the chat, but she lives in Camarillo right now, behind Seasuck. Oh, nice. Right. Um, anyways, oh. so yeah, we are making a a semi carbonic Grenache. Um, we have a Chardonnay Pet Nat that's um, aging in bottle. Yeah um nice. really good yeah we're excited about that one that yeah. one's good so that's um, cool a syrah that had some stem inclusions so that's a little interesting and um a grenache rosé so we went a little big doing five our first year during a pandemic like, oh, while I doing home no, in a viennier. oh in a viennier sorry what was oh that? good <laughs> yeah you know, that's that's just the life biting off more you can chew and then figuring out what to do. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but very cool. Yeah. Anytime you want to come by, just let me know. Happy. Yeah. To awesome. Thanks, Desi. Yep. No problem. I am so sorry, everyone. I myself have to bow out as well. I am super available. I put my email in the chat. Gina might be able to give it to you too, if you have any questions. In all sincerity, um, Alyssa can attest to this as well as Gina. I do all fun things Seabold. So if you have a special event, if you just want to give a really good gift to someone, we do gifting. It's like, we'll pair up, I'll pull some chocolates and some cheese. I know people. Um, and I love to send gifts. I love to do all fun things. Um, Chris gets to do all the boring and the cleaning and I get to do all the fun stuff. So um, my email's in the chat or you can reach out to Gina. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your time. And I hope That's you have a good nice. night and enjoy. Bye, guys. Bye, Tatiana. Bye. This is probably a good spot for all of us to end anyways. We could talk forever, but we know it's Friday night and you probably want to not hang out with us anymore. I don't know. Do something better. Uh, so what the fuck else do you <laughs> And I was going to say, truth be told, uh, I don't have any better offers. <laughs> <laughs> None of us do. <laughs> we did it. Well, um, we love you all. It's really, really fun being able to be so casual and open in these platforms like this. Um, we work with some really special winemakers and good get about our customers and most of our customers end up becoming our friends. So you're all here. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. And the, oh, and also I heard that it's Michelle's birthday. So happy birthday, Michelle. Thank you for celebrating with us. Hey. Yeah, so this is where we all start saying no. No, Mom, don't do that. I, I know, I know you're into it, but just <laughs> that's a bad joke. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, um, thank you for doing this with us, and we look forward to seeing all you guys on the next one. Hey, you know, it's not a, it's too difficult a question right now, but I would be interested in finding out uh, when Lee said, "Oh, her boss or her partner is into." the slate, the granite, you know, the different types of terroir, what flavorings, if you could even Ooh. classify that, you know, uh, does thou, those different terroirs, do those different types of rocks uh, create? Mm -hmm. I think that'd be really fascinating. Now, the, the, next time, the next time we bottle, I'm gonna bring my mother with us so we can have this conversation like and take yeah. it all the way to the mat. Yeah, happy to go over it. Uh, it's way more complicated than I can answer in a few seconds. Right, exactly. That's why I'm just yeah. putting it out there for another time. Yeah, know, in person. Sure. In, yeah. So. I think we could do a, a Google tape thing on that. Yeah. Oh. And Natalie, when when are you, I mean, it just sounds really interesting, the different wines that you're creating. and when would they be available for people to try? Yeah, so we're bottling the rest next month. And uh, then as soon as our license goes through, we have that <laughs> lovely sign in our front window uh -huh. okay. alerting our neighbors. <laughs> okay. But uh, in terms of drinking, are these like, then you have to wait a couple years? No, uh, you know. no. No, they're for, for drinking now, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. great.
Thank you, Darcy. Yeah, I'd like to try that. That'd be interesting. Yeah. We're going to head out. Thank you, Gina. We really yeah. appreciate it. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Very much. Love you guys. Have a great day. And good Bye. to see you. Okay.